All right, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me in the back? Make sure we're loud enough. Okay, good, wanna make sure. All right, well, welcome to our session, Think Different. And what we wanna talk about is trying to use reading list as a way to get libraries more closely embraced in online learning environments. Um, look out across the crowd here, I'm fairly confident most of you will remember the Think Different posters from Apple, uh, which we freely stole for this presentation because that's what we want you to do. Uh, I'm fairly certain, like many of you, we've in, you've encountered the resistance that sometimes happens when you suggest to faculty that bringing the library into their online course is a really good idea. Uh, and so we've tried to get search boxes placed in their courses and we try and get them to help the students understand how to use the library as part of their their online course. Um, and they all nod their heads very nicely and go away and keep doing what they've been doing. So what we're trying to do is say, it, we think there's an opportunity here to hit this problem from another angle. And so what I really want to talk about on, on my part of the presentation here is uh, give you a little bit of context how OU Library's strategic plan kind of shapes what we do in software. And then I want to talk a little bit about our frustrations that we have both with online uh, course environments and with reading lists and, and um, some of the issues we see there. And then I'm going to talk about what is it that students, faculty, uh, and librarians really want from these. We spent some time on our campus talking to each group about what would you like? What, and we bounced some ideas around with them to get, get some feedback. And so uh, we did that. And then we want to talk about how you can take those things we heard and try and achieve that better integration. So first, let me give you a little bit of background on uh, OU and OU libraries. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's frequently, when you think of Oklahoma, you think of a place you fly over, you know, going from one place to another. Uh, or you see on the news for, uh, you know, various reasons lately. And so, you know, I want to I wanna take those on. You can see that OU libraries and OU campus is actually uh, quite a beautiful place. Uh, and so it's, it's a major research institution. And yes, we do have tornadoes. And yes, we have cowboys and we have Indians. We also have students from 114 countries at this university. Uh, we've got 311 national merit scholarships last year. Um, and so we have students that win Goldwater, Truman, and Fulbright scholarships. Our research park, which is a really dynamic part of the university, was ranked first in the nation last year, placing us right alongside Triangle Research Park. Uh, so we're pretty proud of that. And our museums are top in the country. Last year, the Sam Noble Museum of Natural History was one of the top five libraries to receive the National Medal for Museum and Library Services. Uh, so we're pretty proud of that. And at the very top dead center of this chart, uh, that diagram, you will see the library. Up at the very end of all the flowers and the trees uh, is the OU Libraries. And let me magnify that a little bit for you. That's the OU Library. So it's the 1929 building and the 1985 wing. Uh, and there's a 1950s wing behind that. And, and we're, you know, it's a beautiful library with a beautiful reading room in it. Uh, we maintain over 17,000 linear feet of manuscripts and archives. Uh, we're the 32nd largest research library measured by volumes. We've got 1.6 million photographs and more than 1.5 million maps, and we hold 70 books, and our collections were printed before 1501, and the oldest one was published in 1467. So we're also the only library in the world, and we're very proud of this, to have all 12 of Galileo's first edition works. And these, uh, this collection is in fact going to become part of uh, a national exhibition that starts in August of this year and will run for an entire year called Galileo's World. Uh, and it's going to engage the entire campus, the museums, the football stadium. We're going to have a night under the stars in the stadium. Um, and it's all time to celebrate the 125th anniversary of the university. So put that on your calendar. You're going to want to see it. I guarantee it. It's coming soon. Um, we're doing a lot of work. I used to have dark hair, but you know, it, we're getting there. We'll, we'll get this exhibition mounted yet. So let me tell you a little bit about how we position 
the OU libraries on the campus because it plays an important role in software that we uh, put into place on our campus. And what we really are trying to do is position the library as the crossroads of the university. As you see on the slide, uh, we want to be the intellectual commons, a place where all the ideas from all the colleges come together and help improve ideas that come from the other colleges and campuses. We want to expose ideas, we want them to be analyzed, refined, uh, and promoted. And so we use research to do that. We use uh, our facilities to highlight those kind of activities and what we're trying to do is help students build new knowledge. Uh, we very much about knowledge and creation of knowledge so uh, the software we put in place has to be a, a piece that fulfills that mission for us. It has to support that intellectual commons of the university. Which brings me to the main focus of today's presentation which I'll get here uh, which is our reading list. And I want to start by talking about what are our frustrations uh, with online learning environments, with reading lists, and how can we improve this. So I'm going to start uh, talking about the online learning environments because uh, one thing that has never made sense to me is that when we create reading lists in online courses, we kind of create this defined list of resources for students to read. The instructors pick it, they load it, the students are supposed to read it, and that's seemingly the end of it. And I've always thought, well, that's really kind of simple. If we're trying to teach the students how to learn about this subject, uh, shouldn't we be teaching them more about how to find the right resources, to explore other resources, to look at other points of view? And so why do we limit them with reading lists that only give them a certain thing, set of things to read? And so why not teach them the steps to find the right materials? and to help them find the right materials out of all that's available and then to help guide them along as part of what they learn in a course. And so to do that, you know, we've, we've tried, as I said, to put search boxes in courses, uh, but that's been fairly frustrating and uh, basically it reminds me of beating my head on the wall. It's a lot of pain and no gain. So um, I'm really looking for this, you know, what's another approach? How can we convince them uh, to do something? And reading lists really seem like the opportunity that we need to do that. Uh, but first, let me tell you a little bit about reading lists and my frustration with those. Because, you know, I'm sure you've all seen the um, David Lankes has done a diatribe on this in a discussion about ALA posters. Because one of the things that I really don't like about reading lists is that they have the word read in it. And why don't I like that? Well, the reality is read ties us to text-based content. It ties us to journals, it ties us to books. But that's no longer valid. And we know that that's not the case, that we've got all kinds of other resources. And so David has said that, you know, this is like telling people, to use the word read is like telling people to eat or sleep. It's something you have to do to get through life. And so it's pretty meaningless and it's not very inspiring. Um, and I agree with him. I really hate that. And he's uh, got a nice poster on his site where he, he says, let's stamp these things out. Let's, let's get back to something that, that puts us on the right track. And I agree with him. I think what we want is to move to an environment where we are supporting data sets. We're supporting all kinds of other resources, video, webcasts, uh, GIS data uh, points. There's so many other ways that knowledge today gets created and is stored and we need to be allowing our faculty to use all those different kinds of knowledge containers in their courses and so they in within their courses when you talk to them they've got class notes they've got powerpoints they've got you know recorded lectures that they want to put into their courses and most reading list technology does not in any way support that so we spend some time talking, as I said, to student, faculty, and librarians to get, you know, what are your frustrations? What are your experiences with this technology? And what could be better? And so we, we heard a lot from all three groups. I want to start with the, uh, with the students. And one of the first things they said to us, and an overriding theme throughout all three groups that we talked to was, it's got to be easy to use. You know, don't make it convoluted and complicated because their experience with current online course environment reading lists is they're really not easy to use. They're very clumsy, they're very clunky, and they don't enjoy using them. 
For example, what happens when they are remote to the campus or they're at home and they try and get to a resource and the proxies uh, don't function properly and they get presented with a bill to use the resource? Mm, they get pretty irritated about that and quite rightly so. Uh, so they find that very frustrating and they don't want to deal with that. So smooth proxy handling was very important to them. Uh, they want to know what criteria are used in picking the resources that the professor comes up with, you know. I want to know why did the professor think this is the best resource. Um, not that they necessarily will agree, but they want to understand why and what qualified to put this thing on the list. And so we need to help them understand that. They want a button that says, I like this one. This resource worked for me. It helped me understand the course lecture or the content that, that the teacher's trying to inspire us with. So give me more materials like this. Uh, that was one that we heard often. And then the last thing that they said was, you know, uh, because we may be somewhat unique to our institution, but I'm sure it's common on more of yours, because of the number of countries that we have students from, they would love to know, is there a resource on this topic or this particular uh, point that's available in another language? And if so, is it my language? Uh, because if so, they would prefer to use that. It seems like an entirely reasonable request. Then we turned to the faculty, and we heard a whole bunch of things from them. But not surprisingly, the first one is ease of use. They don't want to have to learn anything new to use this technology. Now, personally, I find the irony of that the very people that are supposed to be instructing on our campus not wanting to learn how to do something new. Um, a little hard to digest, but be that as it may, that's one of the things we have to deal with out there. So workflows matter to these people big time. It has to be very simple for them to put this into place. And so they want it to be possible to do it from the discovery tool. They want websites to be one click to add a website to their reading list. Uh, and we need to look at how many clicks does it take to add a website that they think has useful information to their course resource list. So there are all kinds of resources they want to hang on these lists. Uh, they understand it's not just text, it's not just reading material. Uh, they want to add class notes, they want to add slides, uh, materials that they have personally written. Um, whenever it's possible um, to do so, they want to be able to add those very quickly into a resource list. Now, we all know what most faculty do. Um, we know that they don't pay much attention to copyright. They, get a, they find a PDF of a document or they find something and, and they don't pay any attention to copyright restrictions. They just download the article and they upload it into their course and they think they're done. Uh, of course, as librarians, we shudder, we shake, we, we really wish they wouldn't do this. We try and convince them not to, uh, but it's a problem that we have to deal with. So copyright check-in is purely an afterthought form at the moment and again, we need to make it much easier for them to do copyright checking. The other thing we heard quite a bit was we really need good statistics. The instructors really want detailed reports and analytics on the use of the resources in the classes. Um, they want to they want to know that if the links are set up right uh, and, the, and the PDF is, is loaded properly that they can tell who has in fact used the resource and who hasn't. Uh, but they also know that if they don't load it right, they can't get those kind of stats, and so they're frustrated by that. So again, it's a matter of ease of use, and they want to make it uh, possible to get those kind of stats, and if we can make it easier for them to link library resources from the library uh, website or, or other sites that we support, that they'll get better stats. Um, they know that the discovery tool is a very powerful way to find things, but once they're in the discovery tool, they want it to be very simple, one, one or two clicks to add an item they found there to their uh, resource list. So the other thing we heard was that they want to be able to reorder the list. That was a big one. Um, they want to be able to reorder the resource list by subject group, by study group, by week, by topic. Uh, by subject, by it must be read it, optionally to read this one, uh, or by the lecture. And right now, to do that within your existing uh, CMS, in our case, D2L, 
Uh, that requires a separate manual build for each of those lists to be generated, and that's more work than most of them are going to invest. So they were looking for a tool that would make that a lot easier for them. And then, of course, there's the librarians, and of course, they had the longest list, right? <coughs> Not surprising. Um, what we are looking for with with all of these kind of tools and to support that kind of mission as I was talking about is software that keeps users engaged with the library and on a pathway of continuous learning not only while they're at the college but hopefully throughout their lives hopefully if a subject intrigues them and they grab onto it uh, we want them to be able to continue learning we all know that we're facing an increasingly competitive global environment that the need to when you graduate from school by the time you get through a four-year or six-year stay at the university by the time you get out the stuff you learned in the first year is probably already out of date so how do we keep them uh, engaged with it and how do we help them do that so we have to think about as we as we put tools into place to support their learning how do we help them continue their learning throughout their life and so that's one of the things we're looking for with this kind of technology another point that we heard was again as I said earlier support for all types of resources um, certainly librarians know that working with the faculty they're seeing them bring in all kinds of, of different data points we're seeing 3d visualization now start to take off it's one that we're just spending a lot of time and energy in our campus helping people create they want to be able to say hey I want to hang that in my course um, and so we've got to be able to do that kind of work we also want to convince them as I've said earlier that they should use resources from the library website in part uh, we know that this will help us better supply uh, copyright compliance and we know that tools like RefWorks only work if you get it from the library website but not if they take a PDF and load it into the CMS course uh, that's not going to work so being able to do that was very important to them we also want the, the <coughs> resource list software to work on um, um, all kinds of devices it has to work not only on your standard website but on mobile devices it has to work with the discovery tool and it has to be easily placed within the CMS so it's got to be adaptive it's got to easily support those mobile devices and they need to be e able to easily move between different reading lists and the, and the system that's supporting that they also want drag and drop not surprising you know I found a resource I just want to drag it over and drop it on the resource list um, I want to be able to re reorder that list very quickly and add to it and then they want to be able to support uh, the week in a course when a, a resource will appear that was a very common request is that uh, I want to load them all in started semester but I don't want it to display until the second week of the course some other things we heard from librarians they want a link in the recommender system uh, they want perhaps us to, if those of you that have an XLibre system you know we have the BX software that comes up with recommendations why can't we use those recommendations to drive uh, find other resources like this and so that was a, a item that was mentioned by some of them they want to be able to share list uh, and right now I, they showed me what we have to do in D2L and it's really really painful to share lists between uh, students and faculty and so they're looking for a much better way to do this uh, they also want to be able to have uh, students create lists their own reading list maybe they did some research they found things but can they share those lists if they created or is it just something they're emailing around uh, but they'd like to be able to add those into some courses and let them share it so they're looking for all kinds of ways to share lists outside of having to register for that course and be part of it in order to even get access to the list they're looking we're looking as librarians for help in identifying what's the next subscription item that we can get rid of right so we're all running stats to say here's the items that are heavily used we need to be able when we're discussing with faculty what are the items that are actually getting used and it would be so nice if we could say you know if you used resources from the library website we would see that counted in our stats but when you grab a copy and reload it into this D2L system we're not counting those those uses are not part of our number so when that professor comes screaming because you've dropped his subscription to his favorite journal and he's claiming how 
he's using it in his course, we have the capability to say, hold, hold it, you know, we're not seeing it on our end. How'd you do that? And if you do it the way you're supposed to, then we'll see that and we'll get a more accurate count. So those are items that we as librarians are, of course, looking for. We're looking for support of user evaluation resources. Typical five-star ranking system. Let the users rank the resources. They rank professors, they rank courses. Why don't we let them rank the resources within a reading list as which one did they find the most helpful? And so there are some faculty that are not in favor of this. I, I encountered uh, comments in both directions, but it should be there and students should be able to see it. And that ranking would help the course professor also understand what they're offering to students that works for the students. Okay, reporting I've mentioned before, um, but better reporting is of course on the librarians list. Uh, we want to know when things are downloaded, we want to know when they're used, we want to be able to ultimately interface this with the other systems on campus so that we can find out that hey that student got an A, this one got a C, who used the, the content on the resource list, uh, that would be wonderful and would help us show our value to the university by being able to say to administration, look, when they're doing this, uh, they're getting better grades in their courses. So again, we need ease of use in the reporting system. That's very important. We find uh, getting stats out of the existing system, whether it's out of the current library software or the online learning environment <coughs> software, very clumsy and difficult to use. So uh, we're looking for a way that at the end of the course, we can generate a nice simple report with a lot of detail in it about the grades the students got, who used what resources, um, and, and how that might have uh, applied. And I know I'm probably dreaming uh, to some degree on this next one, but I would love to have the capability as we, as we look across our society and we continue to see the polarization, I would love to have an option in software that would say, okay, I've read this on this point of view. Now show me something that's 180 degrees from this point of view. I want to see the opposite point of view on this. Uh, I think that as a part of our teaching people and educating them on subjects would be so nice if we could do that kind of capability. A lot of work to do in making that happen, but it's the kind of thing that I'd like to see us thinking about as we talk about this kind of technology. Let's use this as an opportunity to expand that learning environment. So. Am I going to get all these things in a partnership with Ex Libris? Um, probably not, uh, but I'm realistic about that. Uh, so, you know, what, what we do think, though, is that Ex Libris has formed a partnership. They invited us to the table along with a number of other uh, large institutions. And so we're providing them with our wish list. These are the kind of things that, that we're dealing with. These are the problems we're hearing. Uh, these are the kinds of things we're wishing for. And so that's what we're, we're hoping to achieve. Um, we know that Ex Libris has long been focused on the academic marketplace and that uh, they've been very successful at it. So we were pleased to be asked to be a partner and, and we did become one. And so um, I'm gonna hand it over to Tamar here. If you don't mind, I prefer to stand up, first because uh, I feel more engaging this way, and second because my voice is not very loud, so I think that's the only chance that you could hear me at the back of the room. So, first, uh, first of all, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm going to show you what we're working on, that's the new product, uh, we call it Leganto. Um, <laughs> Carl, Carl doesn't that. like the name, but <laughs> I like it. I think it's a very elegant it name. It stands so. for reader. <laughs> yeah, well, in Esperanto. So um, <laughs> only librarians go and check, and they, they discover that it's uh, actually for reading. Um, so what, what are we talking about? We're talking about something very specific, about resource lists. And I changed the name from reading list to resource list after my, early, my previous session with Carl. Um, so everything that the instructor, that the faculty uh, appends to a course in one way or another uh, for the sake of uh, being processed by the student, and that could be for reading or watching or listening or whatever. So this is the focus of uh, this new product. Uh, when we look at the current challenges, and Carl in his wish list actually echoed um, the challenges. I look at it uh, from the other way around. Okay, what am I coming to solve? 
Um, I think these are the main ones. First of all, to create a resource list is a very complex task. I'm a teacher. By the way, I am really a teacher. I'm teaching at a college, so everything that I say is actually from my personal experience. I don't create really reading lists. Uh, what I do, I need to submit uh, a file which includes the curriculum, the syllabus, and then uh, I uh, divide it to weeks, and for every week I just add a list of citations. I don't need to add links to them at all. So every year I do the same because it's the same course I do year after year. And every year the library takes my file and processes every citation on the list. Although they're, I'm afraid to say they're quite similar from one year to another, but from the library, library's point of view, it's the same, it's a new thing. So it's not really very helpful. And they, every time they go through the same process. Uh, lots of manual work. I know even in, here in the States, I know somebody who comes with a file of books, a pile of books uh, to the library with notes in the books and tells the librarian where to scan and for how many pages and so on. And that's a heavy task, I think, every year to do the same. I think that the most problematic uh, situation is when the instructors bypass the library and uh, what they do is just load materials to the course management system. So that's very easy, but as Carl echoed, there is an issue with copyright, there is an issue with uh, usage because you don't trace it. There's also an issue that the library is not aware of what is going on, so a subject librarian won't know of resources that are actually very important. The collection development is problematic because, again, you don't know what is being used. But um, also, this means that the materials are are very um, are part of the course and not as a different entity, is a special entity. A reading list is a special entity. What we look at it is to have the resource list uh, gathered in a repository, a worldwide repository, that they can be appended to courses when relevant, taken from year to year or from course to course as a whole or parts of them and not just part of a course. Uh, I'm, I'm saying it because it's very common that uh, you're planning to teach something for next year and you're gathering materials and then at the end of the process uh, the course is ready actually and then you need to add the materials. And then this, the next year you actually take the, the list with you. And if you just upload materials to a course management system that's uh, obviously not possible. Uh, the last thing here is the, the new teaching methods that the way we now deal with resource lists via the course management system does not apply to them because the, the participants in these courses are not students so they cannot get into Blackboard or Moodle or whatever. So this is where we stand and uh, we are also looking at finding ways uh, to extend the reach of the library. Libraries become rather transparent for many users, even if they use the library services, they're not always aware that uh, they're using the library. So actually what we want is to find a way to, for the library to better support teaching and learning, to be more involved, to support the, the, the faculty, to support the students, to ensure the proper use of materials and to develop the collections uh, as, it, as the, the library should do. And also to use the course readings as a means to evaluate or to do demonstrate the value of the library to the institution. And this is what Carl hinted at. If we can show that the library invested so and so in course materials and these were used in a way, in that way or another, and then perhaps the average score of students who have read is higher than those uh, who haven't read, so then it's something that is very valuable for the library. So um, we are now developing this product we call the Ganto, and our main user is actually the instructor, although we support obviously the students and the library, but we think that the instructor, the, the faculty, are the most delicate creatures. They are very often uh, not very focused on their teaching because they're researchers, so teaching is just part of their tasks. Uh, as Carl said earlier, they're not always keen on having uh, to learn new technologies. And basically they manage as they did in the last 15 years, so why do they need to change? So 
that we are really trying to make life much better for them in various ways, as I'll, I'll show in a moment. So basically, we let them create the reading lists uh, and uh, maintain them and evaluate them, see what's going on with them, monitor the use. Students can use the same tool to access the materials. Now, libraries, what they do, they actually don't have a user interface to the system because they have already an administrative system of the library. That's the library management system. So they manage the reading lists through the library management system, but they get the input and they are integrated with the, uh, the reading list, the resource list uh, solution. Um, so everything is built on tight integration between the various systems. We don't want to replicate any work, so a course is defined somewhere else in the institution, we just inherit the characteristics of the course so we can append the reading list. It's actually a, something which complements to the course management system. It's, um, so it supports the cross-system uh, workflows and it is a web-based service. Um, so I'll just show you just a couple of screens to, to give the, the idea. Uh, this is uh, a reading a homepage of an instructor. They can come here because they log on to this system or they can go to a specific reading list from the course management system. There are various workflows and each one sees uh, his or her reading lists, uh, can access materials, can add materials to reading lists. You see these are, uh, this reading list is about something. There is some description, some readings, essential readings, and then background readings and the teacher can uh, design the sections as they want. They could be by week, by type of material, or whatever. And then if I look at the specific material on the list, so besides the obvious, like the metadata and the link to the actual material, we offer the instructor some other, I think, very uh, useful information. First of all, some, uh, they can give notes to the library uh, and to the, to the students, but also sh see the availability of the items. As soon as they add an item to the list, they see the availability, the real-time availability. They see in which other reading list the item takes uh, part. So that's important because you know that your students haven't read it or maybe they have, so you change your mind. Uh, and then uh, suggestions for related readings. And these can come from the BX article recommender or explicitly from the library. For example, you want to highlight uh, open educational resources or from an analysis of this repository of the reading lists. Once we have enough data, we can propose, okay, you're building a course for biology 101, so these are the resources that are typically used. And you can either adopt them or not. You can also see on the, on the right hand side um, the discussion list uh, with the students. And then um, if I want to add materials, I just click add materials and I have my collection, collected materials and all I need is to drag and drop and put the item on the list in the right position. And uh, everything here is drag and drop and I can reorder the list and, and build sections and remove sections very easily. Uh, the way to add materials to the reading list is either by pulling them to the reading list, so you are in that place and you search for something and add it, or like you see in here, by being somewhere else in the world and clicking a button on your browser and just uh, pushing items to the reading list. So that could be Amazon. You go to the Amazon website, you find a book, you push it to your resource list, or you could go to... Um, you know, anywhere that you, you spend your time on and then just push materials there. So just to emphasize the thing with the cross-system workflows that I think is extremely important, uh, if we look at a typical institution, we, t we have the course management system, we have the library management system, we have a discovery platform which consists of more than one system typically. So there is the discovery system, but there are others, other systems that people use in the institution. And there are other systems such as authentication system that take part in this party. And uh, external services such as copyright clearance uh, service, agency, depending on the country. What we are introducing here is a new component. That's the resource list component. And uh, we look at the three types of users, the teachers, the students, and the library. And if we take an example of a workflow, 
uh, like uh, the faculty member wishes to add a book chapter to a resource list. This is something that happens very, very often. So what does it mean in terms of workflow? It means that the instructor may go, you know, he has this wonderful idea to add a book chapter, goes, logs into the, to the system and goes to the course management system chooses the course, chooses the, maybe even the week, and clicks the link to the reading list. Now, once uh, the instructor opens the resource list, the instructor can search, can add the book, let's say, goes to Primo, searches the title. I mean, in, in, the, in Leganto, you can search in Primo, sort of uh, through Primo, uh, through Leganto in Primo, find the book, add it to the list by dragging and dropping. Uh, then uh, adds a, a comment for the library saying, okay, I just need chapter six. And by doing so and sending it, just clicking a button, uh, the process begins actually. It is transparent to the teacher because actually they're not, they don't care what happens now, they just want the book scanned, right? So automatically, Leganto sends a notification to Alma, the library management service, uh, and that initiates a workflow in Alma. Now, from there, it goes to the library, right? So uh, the librarian gets the task assigned to that librarian and processes the request, which probably involves several stages, such as scanning the book and then clearing the copyright, and then uh, everything is done so a notification is sent back to Leganto and on the screen the link to the book chapter the scan book chapter appears so that's the kind of idea that everything is uh, just one step after the other although we are talking about different systems in the library um, well animation here works a bit slowly okay. so the core principles what we wanted to achieve there are four core principles first of all to streamline the workflows to make it really simple make the efficient no as much as possible no manual work involved and it's both for the faculty and the library <coughs> Um, to make it very friendly, very engaging. There are quite many options, which I didn't show you, but uh, like uh, commenting and communicating, and students can suggest new materials and these type of things. So um, that would be very important, and it is working on all devices. Uh, actually, it is working already. I mean, the, the UI is also already working. Um, we wanted to offer the teachers services that they didn't have before as incentives for them to use the system. We think this is the, the toughest part to make the faculty members use such systems. So if they can get usage information, they can get recommendations for materials that they didn't know about, uh, they know what their users think about materials, and it's very, very easy and they can take, build a reading list once and take it with them, then we believe that all those things are going to um, please make them try the system. And then support all the means to share, to collaborate, to uh, work together with other peers, uh, other instructors and with the students. So we have uh, five development partners. In addition to the University of Oklahoma, we have uh, KU Leuven in Belgium, uh, two universities in the UK, Kingston University and Imperial College, and a university in Sydney, Australia, University of New South Wales. So we try to look at various re uh, regions and a bit even uh, some um, different languages uh, to capture the need in academia in general. Um, currently, we are uh, uh, we're working with uh, the development partners, and we are assigning early adapters uh, as of this month. We want the first version for the development partners to be live in August. And we are on track, and then the next version, the, the uh, early adapters, will be in February next year, and then general availability at the summer of next year. So, just to sum up, 
Actually, we need to look at the three stakeholders, the teachers, the librarians, and the students. They're all taking part in this game. So from the point of view of uh, the instructors, besides being a fun tool that well, at least we think it's fun, but they may think uh, otherwise, we wanted to give them very clear benefits. We wanted uh, the tool to save them time and effort. It's easy, it's really easy. We wanted uh, to extend their knowledge about new materials and uh, to leave the copyright issues to the library. Once they work with this system, actually the library is involved and can clear the copyright at any stage or comment or say uh, this is impossible or whatever. Uh, know what their students do and think and collaborate with peers. So that's the incentives for uh, instructors to use the system. As for the students, uh, students are uh, actually captured in whatever we will provide them. They have to use the system, so in this sense it's easier, but I think that the tool that you've seen is uh, very much along, along, along the, the, the way they use computers and uh, systems. So it enables them to see the course readings for all their courses in one place because they can log in to the reading list solution. So they can see, they don't have to go from course to course. They can see whatever they have now this week for all the courses. Um, easily access materials, everything should be really uh, just a click away. They can share their views, they can suggest additional materials, so this encourages them to, to look for additional materials and to think about them, as Carl mentioned earlier. Uh, they can look at the uh, readings of other courses. The, this repository of reading lists uh, is actually open, open to anyone. So it depends very much on the creator of the list, whether the creator wishes the list to be open or not. Part of it is probably an institutional policy, and a lot of it is dependent on the person uh, herself or himself. In some cases, like in the UK, many, of, many institutions post the reading lists uh, openly on the web. Uh, others think it's uh, their intellectual property and they hide them, so it's open. And I think that uh, in, the next, in the coming years, the tendency toward uh, openness and transparency will be such that the reading list will be open. So why not look at what is being used in another institution uh, that may be of interest to me? And that could even take you through your life. I mean, you finished studying, but you're still uh, interested in a specific topic, so you can explore uh, reading lists of other institutions. And obviously the collaboration part as well. Now, as for the library, and it's actually for the institution, because things like copyright uh, issues, there maybe the library needs to take care of them but the institution is the one who could be sued uh, and, and is being sued in some cases so um, we we believe that implementing such a component is going to increase the efficiency and save costs and uh, extend the reach of the library make it much more apparent if you go to instructors and try to persuade him to, to use uh, open educational resources you probably won't get their attention. But if something that comes up on the screen, pops up on the screen saying, I mean, you, you assigned this book, uh, textbook to the course, but there is this new thing. It was uh, reviewed by so-and-so. It got fantastic reviews. Why don't you try it? Then it's a, a chance for the library to be more um, persuading, let's say, with the faculty members. Uh, facilitate the proper handling of copyright and optimize the use of the collection. So you know what is being used, you know what to buy, what not to buy. Actually, you go through the list at the end of the year and you see what was not used. That's also very important. And um, certainly by having the reports ready can demonstrate the value of the, of the library to the institution. So that was it, and uh, I believe we have time for questions. All right. Thank you, folks. Appreciate you coming. Thank you very much. Okay. Off to the airport you go. Don't forget your phone. My phone, my bag. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you.
And I know what went wrong with that one slide, so let's fix that.